Retaining walls are structures designed to bound soil between two different elevations. So they are exposed to a combination of gravity and lateral loads. A good design of a retaining wall can maximize the land use and also can increase the property value. So it's a very important structure. But how do you design a cantilever retaining wall? This is Javier Encinas, and today we're going to discuss the required steps in the design of cantilever retaining walls. Let's get started. A typical cantilever retaining wall has four components. One is the stem, which is the vertical portion, the wall that retains the backfill. Then the heel is the portion of the footing at the backfill side. The toe is the portion of the footing at the front of the wall. And finally, the key is the member that projects down under the footing, basically to increase the sliding resistance. The material of the stem can be concrete or can be masonry. The typical loads in a retaining wall are the backfill, the water table, the surcharge that can be uniform or a strip. The stem can have also concentrated loads at the top. And finally, the portion of the wall that projects above the backfill can be exposed to wind. If the wall is in a seismic zone, the wall needs to be designed also for seismic forces. The effect of the backfill on the retaining wall can be represented by the lateral soil pressure, which in turn can be defined as the lateral coefficient times the vertical pressure. The lateral soil pressure can be calculated by two well-known classical theories. One is ranking and the other is Coulomb. There are three states of the lateral soil pressure used in the design of retaining walls. One is the active pressure, the second is the at rest pressure, and the third is the passive pressure. The active pressure state is developed when the wall moves away from the soil and uh, the shear strength is developed at, at that point. The passive pressure is developed when the wall pushes against the soil and the shear capacity at that point is also developed. This graph shows the shear capacity represented by this red line and in the horizontal axis are represented the vertical and horizontal stresses. This circle represents the active state and this point is the active pressure which is the vertical stress multiplied by Ka, which is the active coefficient. This big circle over here represents the passive state, and this is the vertical, vertical stress multiplied by Kp, which is the passive coefficient, and this gives us uh, the horizontal passive pressure. As you can see, in a typical soil, the passive pressure is much larger than the active pressure. For the active and passive pressure to be developed, it is necessary the wall to move. In the design of cantilever retaining walls, normally the active pressure is used because the wall moves away from the soil and this active pressure can develop. Once the loads are defined, the first step in the design of cantilever retaining walls is checking the stability failure modes. There are four modes that need to be checked. The first one is sliding, second overturning, third soil bearing and then global instability. In the sliding failure mode, the backfill exerts a pressure lateral to the wall and this force is counteracted by the friction between the footing and the underlying soil. The sliding safety factor is uh, defined as the resisting force over the driving force. And this safety factor should be more than 1.5. In the overturning failure mode, the loads on the backfill pushes the wall and uh, creates an overturning moment around the end of the toe, and the wall turns to overturn. This overturning moment is resisted by an opposite moment created by the gravity forces. The overturning safety factor is equal to the resisting moment over the overturning moment and the overturning safety factor should be 1.5 minimum. In the soil bearing stability failure mode, we check the soil bearing pressure under, under the wall. 
the allowable soil pressure for the soil is given by the, in the soils report. So in this mode, we check the applied soil bearing versus the allowable soil bearing. And the safety factor should be 1.0 minimum. In the global instability, a surface is created under the wall that creates a massive disturbance of the wall and moves the whole structure. This uh, analysis is very complex and uh, belongs to the geotechnical engineering field. As the Britain shows the overturning calculations in a tabular form, here we can see the overturning calculations and here the, re the resisting calculations and here the overturning safety factor is calculated. The same applies to the sliding calculations, which are in this area here. As the Britain shows graphically, the loads apply to the wall for the stability analysis. Here is the pressure due to the surcharge. This is the pressure due to the backfill, and this is the water table. This blue area represents the bearing pressure. This red area represents the passive pressure. This image below shows the forces for the stability analysis. This is the vertical resultant, the horizontal resultant, the friction between the footing and the underlying soil. This is a vertical reaction, and this is the passive force. As the Britain also shows the stability safety factors for uh, quick checking. Once the stability failure modes are checked, the next step is the design of the components of the wall. The stem is subject to the pressures due to the surcharge, to the backfill, to the water table, and the seismic forces, if any. The maximum bending moment occurs at the base of the wall, and the maximum shears occur at the critical section. In the image below, as the Britain shows the moment diagram represented by this red line, the blue area represents the flexure capacity of the stem. And here we can see the shear diagram, the red line, and the blue area is the shear capacity of the section. In the footing tab, we can design the toe and the heel. For the toe, this is the bearing pressure acting upwards to the, to the toe, which can be designed as a cantilever beam. So all this pressure acting on this area creates a bending moment along this line. For the heel design, the weight of the backfield is acting downwards on the top of the hill, which is acting as a cantilever beam as well. It's common practice to ignore the bearing pressure uh, at the bottom conservatively and only design the, uh, the hill just for the gravity load. So the rebars should be placed at the top of the, of the hill and the bar should be placed at the bottom of the uh, toe. As the Britain generates a sketch with the rebars for the stem and for the footing, to optimize the design, alternate rebars in the stem can be cut off. For example, if we don't cut off the rebars, this is the capacity of the of the stem. But we have a you know too much capacity in, in this area, so we can cut off alternate rebars and it's more efficient that way. As you can see, it's very easy to optimize the design uh, in, in as written. So in summary. The design of cantilever retaining walls includes two steps. In the first step is the check of the stability modes for sliding, for overturning, and for soil bearing. With the members already sized to satisfy the stability failure modes, the second step is the structural design of the components of the wall. For the stem, it is necessary to find the maximum moment and the maximum shear at the critical section. For the footing, it is necessary to investigate the maximum moment and shear at the critical sections as well, and design the rebars accordingly. At the end, the wall will be sized to satisfy stability for the service loads, and will be structural design for the factory loads. As the written shows a summary of the results, where you can see the stability checks, the soil bearing pressures, the shear forces that define the thickness of the members, and finally the reinforcement for the stem, for the toe, and for the heel. Graphically, you can see the stability check with all the pressures and the resulting forces for the stability and the stability safety factors.
This is the stem design for the factor loads. This is the controlling load combination. They produce this bending moment and this shear diagram. The blue area represents the bending capacity and the shear capacity. In this case, we can see that the bending moment is, is inside the blue area, so the capacity is more than enough for the applied loads, and the same applies for the shear. The construction tab shows sketch with the rebars uh, that produce the capacity that we show in the previous uh, diagrams. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you in the next video.